I don't know if you've ever read or heard or, you know, quibs or sayings of an old wise farmer, but I read some of them this week and they uh, impressed me a little bit. I wanted to share a few of them and then especially one of them that uh, really applies to our message. The old farmer says, uh, meanness just doesn't happen overnight. Meanness just, just doesn't happen, happen overnight. Another one, uh, the old wise uh, farmer said, uh, life is a whole lot simpler when you plow around the stump. <laughs> life is a whole lot simpler if you plow around the stump. Uh, there's another one that was kind of interesting. He said, uh, sometimes you get and sometimes you get got. <laughs> you got to be from the south to understand that. <laughs> sometimes you get, but sometimes you get got. <laughs> But the one that I wanted to really point out today is uh, the old wise farmer said this, the biggest troublemaker you'll probably ever have to deal with in life watches you from the mirror every morning. <laughs> it's you. Um, we are on the mission of the suffering servant king. Mark chapter 1. Breaking in at verse 21, and I'll invite you to, in honor of God's word as you're able to stand as I read our uh, text today. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone! What have you to do with what what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice he came out of him and then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying what is this what what new doctrine is this for with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him and immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John but Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. At evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose... I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was healed cleansed and he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him see that you say nothing to anyone but go to go your way show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony of them however he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in desert deserted places and they came to him from every direction. May the Lord bless the public reading of his word. Now, if you're here today and uh, you got something on your heart, all of us do, I'm sure. Uh, take your hand and put it over your heart and uh, just release that to the Lord. Father, we come today, we're 
your people, the sheep of your pasture. We've again entered into your uh, courts with praise. We're here to worship you. We're here to hear from you. Speak to us through your word. Minister to our hearts just as you did when you were on earth, Lord Jesus. In your human flesh, you touched and you healed. And God, bring cleansing and healing to our lives today as we listen to your word. Meet every need, the deepest need of every person here today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When Christ's kingship comes, all other thrones, including the God of self, must fall. That's really the message today. Christ the King has come. The suffering servant king has arrived. And we saw that, 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 that the king didn't just arrive, but, but he calls people to, to join him in his mission. What was Jesus, what is Jesus' mission? You see, Jesus Christ did not come to show us his power. He did not come to debate. He came to redeem a broken world and to begin the process of restoring this world and our hearts as they were meant to be. You see, that's our problem today in this modern age. We, we try, don't we? We try to hold everything together, don't we? Our, our bank accounts, our, our money, uh, our, our marriages, uh, our planning, our appearances, how we appear to other people, and we, I could just go on. We, we try to hold, don't we, in ourselves, we try to hold it all together. But, but everything in this world, folks, is broken, if you haven't, if you haven't realized it. Uh, uh, there is poverty. There is injustice. Uh, our bodies are dying every day. <laughs> we don't like to think about that. <laughs> That's happening. Disease. Cancer. Oh, nobody likes to hear that word. Sickness. Our souls. Our souls are broken. There is betrayal. There is bitterness. There is unforgiveness. Thank God for that song. Uh, God, oh, un so much unforgiveness. There's divorce. There's, there's broken relationships. We need a suffering servant king to come in and break through and, and, and to not only rescue us, but to restore us. Jesus came not only to rescue, to save. He is our Savior, but he came to restore us. And we have a powerful king who enters into our brokenness, into our broken world, but, but there's a cost to bring beauty into brokenness. We are all called, we're to call broken people back to their creator. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're to call broken people back to their creator. What is the mission of the suffering servant Jesus? Just two things I want to mention today in the message. The first, thing, the first part of Jesus' mission was to reestablish his authority. You see, Jesus leaves Capernaum, where the bulk of his ministry, by the way, was, had, uh, would happen eventually. And in verse 29 it says, They left. And you remember he's already called some of his disciples. We know four of them. They were fishermen, and he called them, and they left immediately. That's Mark's favorite word, as you're seeing here. Immediately, they left and followed Jesus. But he doesn't call them just to attend seminars. He doesn't call his disciples just to... Uh, you know, discipleship is about being with Jesus. In chapter 6, we see this. When we get over to chap chapter 6 and verse 7, it, the Bible says this, And he called the twelve to himself, and he began to send them out two by two, and he gave them power over the unclean spirits. And then in verse 30 it says, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all the things both that they had done and what they had taught. They learned on the way with Jesus. And that's, why, that's how we learn. You see, his team is with him, but the interesting thing, the funny thing, I guess you would call it, is that they don't do anything, really. Jesus doesn't need us, really, but, but he's glad to have us on his team, despite all of our inadequacies, despite all of our failures. But really, any spiritual fruit that we ever see is from watching him work. <laughs> 
And how does he reestablish his authority here as the suffering servant king? The first thing is he, he shows the priority of the word, the word of God. It says he entered the synagogues and he starts teaching. Now, what was a synagogue? A synagogue was kind of like a church today, but, but a synagogue was, it was a multi-purpose place. This where the Jewish people worshipped, and during the week there was a school there for kids, and sometimes there, it was a courthouse for minor uh, uh, cases that they brought. It was a place of prayer. It was a place of reading the Old Testament scriptures and teaching. And apparently in, when there were rabbis like Jesus, they could just come in the synagogue and they could just, you know, wouldn't just start teaching. And that's what Jesus did here. And notice that Jesus did not teach from authority. The Bible says he taught with authority. Somebody say with authority. With authority. Jesus taught with authority, not from authority. And that, that was fresh. That, this, there was a directness to what he taught that went deep down into their hearts and it disturbed them. It's, it uses the word here, astonished. They were astonished. <laughs> and uh, that word literally means to be having uncomfortable terror. They were astonished. They were convicted because Jesus had not come just to comfort the afflicted. He had come to afflict the comfortable. And uh, we see this over in Matthew chapter 11, verse 23. Listen to these words. Jesus said um, in Matthew 11, uh, 20, 23 and 24, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. For I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Remember Sodom? Sodom and Gomorrah? Jesus said to the people in Capernaum, the city of Capernaum, he said, it, uh, uh, Sodom is in better condition than Capernaum because why? Their unbelief. Jesus did most of his miracles were done in and around, his early ones were done around Capernaum. He, and they didn't believe. You see, the Lord, even though he reestablishes authority, he never, Jesus, our Lord Jesus never forces anyone to come under him. Jesus will never, God, God in Jesus Christ will never force you to come under his word. That's not the way he works. And, uh, and later, he is praying, and uh, the disciples find, try to find him, and they find him, and in verses 37 38, if you remember what I read there, um, they said, everybody's looking for you. <laughs> Where have you been? And Jesus was over, he was in a solitary place by himself. And he was praying. And basically what he told them was, uh, let's, go, let's go somewhere else. Because that's why I've come. I've come to share, you know, he, the Bible last Sunday, we found, he came preaching. What did he say? Repent. Believe in the gospel, the good news. Repent, believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that God has come. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm not just going to meet the needs that you know you have. I'm going to meet the needs that you don't even know you have through the preaching of the word of God. I'm going to preach the word, Jesus said. I'm going to call people to be converted. I'm not just going to feed the hungry. I'm not just going to heal the sick. You see, that's the ministry of the Word. That's the gospel. We need to be changed, don't we? We're human beings. We are sinners. We're insufficient of ourselves. We're weak. We are flawed. We need God. We need grace. We are broken, folks. I don't know about you. I'm a human. We are broken. And so, we don't want to hear that, but Jesus says... You also have a lot of needs that you don't even know you have. And it won't be loving for me not to try to meet those needs, the deepest needs that you have. Folks, this is, this is, the, this is the burden of every pastor. This is the burden of every preacher, I believe, today. Every minister of Christ. You see, I'm, I'm not the meal, folks. <laughs> if you came... Uh, today, uh, I'm not the meal. I, I, I'm just the waiter. 
I'm just the waiter serving the meal. I'm not even the chef. The Lord Jesus is. And you know, when I leave church um, on Sunday, sometimes I feel okay and sometimes I, I wonder <laughs> if God has really used me. But, but when I leave and I'm overwhelmed of how great Christ is at the end, I know that God was speaking and Christ has been exalted, if that's my feeling as a preacher. You know, it is, it is possible to sit down for a meal in it and never eat. Is, that, is it possible? Sure, sure it is. I wonder how many of us do that at, at church. You know, we sleep late at night on Saturday night or we fill our other time, time with all our emotions and our lives with other things and we, we come to church spiritually starved and we leave starved sometimes. You know, this place, folks, it, this is a place to meet the Lord. And if that's not why you came today, you didn't come for the right purpose. This is a place to meet God. This, this is a place to meet the Lord. And, and it's our job to get something out of the preacher, out of the message, no matter who he is. You see, we're, we're, learn, we're going to learn this week. Look behind me. We, we are not spectators on the sideline. We are participants in the game. <laughs> That's the message this week. Game on. <laughs> game on. I hope you're not just a spectator. You see, we get too comfortable, don't we? We, we, want, we want God, we want, we want Jesus just like, we, to, like a vending machine. <laughs> you know, we, just want, we just want Jesus to, to meet our needs. But when the real Jesus, when the suffering servant king arrives on the scene, as we see here in the Bible, <laughs> when he comes, he shows up, and he reestablishes his authority by the power of the Word of God and shows us needs that we don't even know we have. Some of you have needs today that you don't even need you have. You, you have some needs that you're feeling, but I'll tell you, you've got some needs deep down in your heart you don't even know that you have. And the Word of God can meet those needs. The second way that Jesus reestablishes authority is to emphasize Word with works. You see, word always goes with works. You need both for ministry. Light, light always exposes darkness. Sin, sin grows in the dark. It's like mold, folks. You ever had any mold? That's, that's a beautiful illustration of sin grows in the dark. But the word of God, the word of Christ, when you shine the light of Jesus Christ, we see our sin. We see what is lacking. Our pride and sin is broken down. And only when Jesus Christ breaks through. Amen? Can I get an amen? The presence of Jesus, we found out here, means the end of demons. <laughs> The, road, the end of the road for the demons here. Je Jesus has invaded this, this, the spirits, the territory of the spirits. This is an indictment on people who are spiritually dead, who are, who are, who are without Christ today. The demon here, notice, the demon, the devil's uh, servants, the demon even quickly acknowledges the person of Jesus and shrieks out, You're the Holy One of God! Leave us alone! <laughs> See, the demon's about to be exercised. Because literally, Jesus says, shut up. <laughs> it says, uh, New King James says, be quiet. But it literally, in the Greek there, Jesus says, shut up and come out of him. And that's what happened. The demon came out. With his authority, he reestablishes order. And out of the chaos in this man's life, it says he was filled with an unclean spirit. Satan's powerful rule was coming to an end. People, people here are amazed that not only Jesus' teaching is fresh with new authority, but, but with authority, that authority extends into the supernatural. Folks, there is an unseen world. I know there's a physical world. We're, we're in the, we in the West uh, separate, you know. There's the, uh, what is it, we call it, the sacred, <laughs> and then there's the secular. Folks, God doesn't look at it like that. And as a matter of fact, in the East, they don't look at it like that. We lived over in the East. They don't compartmentalize. The spirit world and the physical world are all together. 
There is an unseen world out there. We, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You know, we don't really have any enemies. If you're a Christian, you don't have any human enemies. There's Kim Jong-un. Remember Mount Seton? We don't have... We wrestle against principalities and power, powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where the battle is, folks. In people's hearts and their minds. The, it's a, Jesus can, came and he can deliver anyone from the worst situation. What, what do we do with all this demon stuff in the Bible? What, what do we do with it? Well, let me say just this. Avoid reductionism. Avoid reducing it, either reducing everything to the devil or reducing everything to science and medicine. We live in a modern, complicated world. And if you look at verses 32 through 34, there's a distinction between people who were sick and people who had demons. In other words, Jesus doesn't see the demon-possessed man and he called for a doctor. No, no. Uh, neither does he see Peter's mother-in-law and start casting out demons. She was sick. She had a fever. Sometimes we just, in this world, we just label people's issues in a very simplistic and naive way. Most of the time, there are several factors that are interlocking in human experience. It's complex. It's multi-dimensional. Uh, but we must never label or put people in boxes. And certainly not put God in a box like we tend to do. <laughs> it's more complicated. Now, I do not believe that believers in Jesus Christ can be demon-possessed. That means the devil inside of them. I do believe, I think that believers can be strongly affected and influenced by the devil and by evil. The enemy works on our emotions, folks. I think that's the one thing that we all struggle with a lot, emotion. Uh, the, the enemy works on our Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. Jesus moves in closer. He takes her by the hand. He just gently lifts her up. And, folks, when Jesus was doing that, he was breaking a whole bunch of rules. <laughs> he was breaking every, almost every cultural rule you can think of. He was touching a woman who wasn't his wife. You didn't do that. <laughs> and... This woman was sick. He was touching a sick woman. <laughs> In Jewish customs, you did not do it. Jesus was breaking lots of rules here. You see, Jesus was very controversial. And he still is. <laughs> he still is. Jesus Christ. In Christ, we see strength here, but we see tenderness. We see absolute power. We see control. We see conviction, but we see approachability. We see sensitivity. He's the king, but he is what? The suffering servant king. The suffering servant king. And this is the goal of Jesus' mission. Word and works. And notice when he healed Peter's mother-in-law, what did, what did she do? She got up and served him. She got up and served them. And finally, Jesus, he, he reestablishes authority by demonstrating priorities. Here's where the rubber hits the road. If, you, if you've been uh, resting on me, uh, wake up a minute. Here's where the rubber hits the road for us who are followers of Jesus today. Jesus demonstrates priorities. He is so busy, what does he do? He prays. He goes to pray. What do we say? I'm so busy, I don't have any time for prayer. <laughs> That's modern Christians. But Jesus said, I'm so busy, I have to pray. I'm so busy, I've got to get away. And that's what he does. He says he goes out into a solitary place by himself, and he begins to pray. The busier he gets, the more he prays. Folks, if, I, if you and I are flawed, weak people, we're, and, and, if we, and if Jesus thought he needed more prayer, the busier he got, how much more we need it. We live in such a busy world. I don't know about you, but I am give out most weeks, especially in this heat. <laughs> prayer was a priority in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was supreme. It was a supreme priority. We must pray. 
How much time do you spend praying? It's an indictment on preachers. I just read an article. The average pastor <laughs> only spends six minutes in prayer a day in the United States. I'm glad I'm not average <laughs> because I have to pray, folks. We must be like Jesus. Jesus was so busy that he took time to pray. I like what August, St. Augustine said. You see, all, all sin is really disordered love. I like what Augustine said this. It's not that we love the wrong things, but we love them in the wrong order and the wrong amount. It's like the little girl who was, who was tasked with, with putting a map of the United States to reassemble this map together, and she was having all kinds of trouble. Juliana, she couldn't put this map back together. <laughs> And you know what she discovered? On the other side, there was a picture of George Washington. So she turned the map over, and she put the picture of George Washington together, and she turned it back over, and the map was together. Beautiful, a profound truth. Nothing can be assembled either in your life or in this universe apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we know him, all things find their place. But Jesus didn't come just to reestablish his authority. He came to redeem us completely. This last story on leprosy. As, as the king, he exerts his authority, word and power. He's the suffering servant. He redeems us completely. Notice what happens to this leper. You see, leprosy was not just a disease. If you had leprosy in the day of Jesus, it affected everything. <laughs> you in every way, physically, socially, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. If you've turned on, which I can't do it, these uh, movie, these uh, shows, the zombies. <laughs> Lepers were kind of like the zombies, folks, the, that they make up in television today. Th that that just gives you kind of a picture. Uh, the, they would lose, if you had leprosy, you would lose all your nerve sensations and, and sometimes your fingers and your toes would just start falling off. Socially, they were outcast. They were supposed to be away from other people and whenever people started to come to them, they had to yell out and say, I, I, leper, I'm a leper. Now, it was very bold for this leper to have come close to Jesus. Again, it shows the approachability of Jesus. This leper comes to Jesus. Jesus is a multi-dimensional Savior who will give him everything that his soul needs. Because Jesus Christ came into this world to redeem us, to give us salvation, but also to put us into community and change every part of our lives. Jesus touches the untouchable. Now, does Jesus need to touch this, this guy to heal him? No, because we know other times all Jesus did was just speak. All, actually, all he had to do was just think. <laughs> and he's done it. So he's not touching this man because his body needs to be touched. He's touching him because his soul needs to be touched. Jesus says, it doesn't matter who you are, folks. No matter who you are, what you have done, what... It's been done to you. How inadequate today you feel. How, how, how lonely or how lost or how confused or whatever you feel today. How ashamed you are. How bad, how guilty you feel today. If you come to Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I will make you clean. I will make you whole. I will save you. I will redeem you completely. Amen? Amen. That's who Jesus is. It doesn't matter how stained how tainted what you've done or what you've not done. Jesus said, I am the very definition of clean. I'll clean you up. You see, we must identify and love people and get them into contact with Jesus who alone can make them whole. That's our job. That's our mission today. And notice what he does to this guy, though. I'm coming to an end, folks. He sends him away to the priest. Now, why? Why? Because the priest, folks, in that day was the public, um, was kind of like the public uh, uh, health person. 
officer who could certify that he was healed, and more importantly, he could integrate, reintegrate this lonely guy back into uh, community, back into society. But notice what he also tells him. <laughs> this is strange, isn't it? What does he say? Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. But what does this guy do? He goes out and he says he's broadcasted everywhere. So much that Jesus' popularity became so great that he couldn't even go. He, he, would, he was like, if you all remember back in my day, Elvis. Elvis couldn't go out during the daytime. Because he would, I mean, people would just, that's, Jesus was popular. And so he had to go into the outside places and people would come to him. This is interesting, isn't it? Jesus told the man to keep quiet, and yet he told everybody, and yet Jesus commands us to go tell everybody, and what do we do? We don't share. When's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? We keep quiet, don't we? We do the opposite of the leper. And in the end, these guys trade places. The outsider is brought in, <laughs> and the chosen one is cast out into the out. Side places, And this is also a beautiful picture of what happened to Jesus at the end of his life. We're going to see as we get through the book of Mark. They trade places. Uh, he trades places again, except at the end of the Mark, he trades, trades places with you and me. <laughs> Here he trades places with a leper. In the end, on the cross, he takes your place and my place. You see, folks, we have a disease far worse than leprosy. <laughs> Amen? We are all contaminated with sin. We're living in isolation. We're alienated from God in our natural state. And the servant king has come. He's treated like a leper. He's crucified, the Bible says, outside the gate, outside the city. What's outside the city? The garbage dump, Gehenna, the place where they put all the garbage, the place where the lepers had to go. He became outcast. Jesus, the perfect, spotless Sinless Son of God becomes unclean so that you and I can become clean. Jesus was treated as an outcast, and yet we are accepted into the presence of God by trusting and putting our faith in Him. Hallelujah. There ought to be some amens on that one. Amen. You see, Jesus didn't overlook uncleanness. He conquered it. He conquered it. He didn't just conquer it. He traded places with it. <laughs> Today, friend, do you want to come under the servant king's authority? Do, do you want his word to leave you astonished and amazed? Do, do you want him to reprioritize your life and turn chaos and disorder into peace and order? How can we, how can we be on that kind of a mission like Jesus? Simple, very simple. See him on mission, on the cross, dying for you. This is the gospel. This is the good news that we've all been waiting for. That God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son to come down here to this earth to live a perfect life that you and I can't live and to die an excruciating death in our place so that now if we trust in him, we will have a relationship with God and we will live forever with Him when we die. This is the gospel. Look at Jesus today until your eyes and your heart melts and your feet begin to move. His blood can change the leopard's spots and melt the heart of stone, the hymn says. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth more grace. Let's stand. Father, we stand today in Your presence, searched through and through by Your Word. And as we sing... This hymn, this great old hymn of Jesus paid it all. 
May we truly, honestly say those words, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, if there's anybody here today who's never personally put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, may this be the moment. And Lord, for your people, those of us who know you, may we be challenged to be on the same mission, Lord, that you were on when you came to this earth, and that's to rescue and restore but Lord we know it's not our work it's you working through us speak to our hearts today I pray in Jesus name